Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight, um, Mary Toothman. Mary is a grad student um, pursuing her PhD at UC Santa Barbara, um, and she's been working up here at Snarl for the last several years. She was actually one of our um, graduate student award recipients in the last year, uh, doing her work on the mountain yellow-legged frogs. And I first got to know Mary last year, last summer actually, when she was up here doing her work. Um, she is very um, uh, involved in this disease and understanding what's causing this disease in mountain yellow-legged frogs. And she's um, gonna tell you a lot more about mountain yellow-legged frogs and um, immunity and the environment tonight. So, Mary. Thank you. <laughs> All right, really fast, you guys. I'm just gonna reset my timer, and there we go. All right, thank you guys so much for coming tonight. I'm really excited to be here, uh, really honored that Carol invited me to come give a talk. Um, as a grad student, we don't have that many opportunities to give really nice long talks where we can tell stories and, and actually engage with the public. A lot of our talks are shorter and, uh, and have to really get to business. So I'm really excited to be able to give you guys a little bit of a longer talk tonight. And I'm also really excited because I'm doing it here at Snarl. Um, this community is the closest public that there is to the system in which I work, which is in the Sierra Nevada and Mountain Yellow Legged Frogs. So, to get started on this, I want you guys to just imagine that you're out for a hike in the mountains. <clears throat> the air is crisp, the clouds are billowing in the sky, there's some snow here and there, there's a stream babbling by. You're probably hiking in protected land, and so therefore there probably aren't a lot of people around. It's just you and nature. And unfortunately, there's also this. So the deadly amphibian chytrid fungus, Batrachochytrium dendrobotitis, which I'm just going to call BD from here on out, began decimating amphibian populations all over the world at least 30 years ago. Um, there's a good chance it was happening a long time before that, but it's been really hard to reconstruct the timeline. <clears throat> in the Sierra Nevada, where it also first started declines about 30 year, years ago in mountain yellow-legged frogs, we witnessed the disease move through in a wave-like fashion from north to south in the Sierra Nevada, leaving scenes like this in its wake. And just so it's clear, when you see a scene like this um, in the Sierra Nevada, there are rarely survivors. And this indicates the extirpation or local extinction of this population. <clears throat> Surprisingly, however, there's a slight bright side to this. Researchers discovered that there were actually healthy uh, populations of mountain yellow-legged frogs living in the northern Sierra, and they were living with the disease. And they didn't know um, that they were infected with the disease until there was a test that was developed to be able to, to, to show that it was in nature and to be able to detect it in nature. So the focus of my talk is tonight to describe efforts of our research group here in the Sierra Nevada to understand the mechanisms that allow certain populations to survive with a BD outbreak um, and persist, while others are driven rap rapidly to extirpation. And finally, our main goal is to use this knowledge to inform conservation actions that increase the chances of more frog populations surviving in the wild with BD. So I'm actually going to take you guys back really fast. We're going to leave the Sierra Nevada, and we're going to go back a few decades um, to the first annual World Herpetological Congress, which took place in 1989 in Canterbury, England. And the purpose of this Congress was to bring together people who studied amphibians and reptiles from all over the world just so that they could convene and, um, and share their knowledge of evolution, phylogeny, um, the ecology of herps. Uh, it was at this meeting in 1989 that a lot of amphibian researchers were having drinks together, having informal meetings, and they were all telling each other surprisingly frightening stories. And these stories were that at field sites that a lot of these researchers had been, had been visiting for sometimes up to decades, they were seeing their frogs disappear. And um, the more that they realized that this was a consensus and this was happening all over the world, uh, the more they became alar alarmed and used this meeting as a kind of jumping off point from which to start mobilizing and organizing to figure out what was causing these declines. 
So it took a little while. Um, at this meeting, really, disease wasn't really on the table. There were a few people who had some, who suspected disease, but for the most part, people were concerned about habitat loss, um, about um, other factors in the environment that might be actually causing these declines. And it wasn't until 1997 that first, the first group of researchers realized upon examining the skin of frogs that were associated with die-offs, with full population die-offs, that in the skin of these frogs, there, were, there was actually an organism there. And in animals that had died from uh, in these die-offs, th there was a lot of this organism in the skin. And this organism was BD. And so really quick, I just want to show you guys how BD works. BD is a fungus. We should start with that. And it starts off in a single-celled, I should actually use the pointer here. It starts off as a single-celled, um, I actually don't know where it is, so here we go. Single-celled um, modal, meaning that it can move around in the environment through this flagella right here. Um, zoospore, and what this zoospore does is it searches its environment to find a suitable substrate in which it can insist. And so in the case of this particular fungus, it's going to be in frog skin. Um, and so what happens is once it finds that suitable substrate, it insists into the skin and it reabsorbs this flagellum and then sends out rhizoids. And what those rhizoids do, and those are these little, these little structures here, is that they anchor the, um, the zoospore into the skin cell. And then it it inserts itself into the skin cell, it starts to reproduce, and it forms this structure here, which is um, it's, it's just an enlarged sporangia. And inside the sporangia are reproducing um, multiple, multiple zoospores. And when those spo zoospores mature, they actually leave the sporangia through what we call a discharge tube. And what this discharge tube does is it either puts them out into the environment or it puts them in a position where they can immediately reinfect the frog skin uh, just adjacent to it. And so what this looks like, and the way that, that BD kills frogs, is that in normal frog skin, this is a cross-section of the frog skin, you can see that the cells are really well organized, and the epidermis is, um, it's, it's nice and it's thick, but it's also, it's very smooth. And when you have a chytrid infection, and this is a very, very, heavy chytrid infection. That outer epidermal layer um, is highly infected with, these are all sporangia right here with growing zoospores inside of them. And having that many zoospores, or I'm sorry, sporangia in the skin, in the outer layer of the skin causes what we call hyperkeratosis. And hyperkeratosis is a thickening of the skin. And when the skin thickens, it's really important for, important for amphibians to uh, take water and electrolytes across their skin surface. Um, they use their skin basically to drink. And um, when the thickening of the skin occurs, this is impossible. And they die of dehydration. And when they lose those electrolytes from hydration, they die basically of a heart attack. And so this is what's occurring when uh, frogs die from chytridiomycosis. However, as with most diseases, we can see different dynamics and outcomes um, in terms of how the host interacts with the pathogen that's invading it. And so when we talk generally about disease, there are different ways that we describe hosts and how they deal with infection. And so, um, when you're resistant to a disease, this means that you either resist infection, you don't become infected, or you become infected, but at a load or infection intensity that your body can handle and that doesn't cause disease. And so in BD um, and amphibians, we actually have a number of species that we recognize as universally kind of resistant. And um, those are actually the three species that I have here. Um, the first species down here on the bottom is Xenopus lavis, and this is the African clawed frog. And the African clawed frog um, can become infected, carries relatively low loads, but what's really important to know is that this frog has been distributed globally over the last century because it was used in pregnancy tests before they figured out how to make a lab test to determine whether a woman was pregnant. And so after they figured out how to make this lab test, they just released Xenopus all over the world into whatever local environment they were in. We have endemic invasive populations in Southern California of Xenopus lavis, and they're from South Africa originally. 
Um, so the second species that's up here is, should look pretty familiar. This is the American bullfrog, um, whose name I think currently is Lithobatius catesbianus, but they are changing the names on these guys really fast. And American bullfrogs um, are very similarly, they carry low infections of, um, of BD, and they've been globally distributed through the pet and food trade. And um, they're highly invasive, they can eat anything, they can live anywhere, and this has made them also uh, considered responsible partially for the global spread of, of BD around the world. And then finally, we have a slightly different species, and this may look familiar to you guys. Um, this is a used to be a Sudacra species, now a Hyliola species. Um, this is a tree frog. Um, we have here in the Sierra, the Sierra tree frog. Um, in California, we have a number of different species of these chorus and tree frogs. And in nature, these guys actually don't, um, they're, they're not highly susceptible to BD. And so they are, they're not invasive, but they're pretty much ubiquitous around California. And so they also have been implicated in, um, in being environmental reservoirs in these natural populations of amphibians for BD. So that's resistance. Um, another way that we describe hosts and their interactions with pathogens is as tolerant. And when you're tolerant of a disease, then you can actually carry a really heavy load, a really high load of disease that would normally, or of the, of the pathogen, that would normally cause disease in someone else or in, in another organism, but it's not causing disease in you. And to be honest, we just don't see that in frogs. We don't see amphibians that are carrying really high loads of BD and surviving with it. So that's not generally something that we see in this system. But then we have susceptible animals, and this is what most of the amphibians that we know of around the world are. And this is, you become infected with, with the fungus in this case. Uh, you, you very rapidly get really high infection intensities or loads and then um, become very sick and die from the fungus. And so um, that's what we're focusing on today. And so this is a really good segue to the fact that in BD, illness and death are load dependent. And by when I say load, I mean infection intensity. I mean the amount of the pathogen that you, I keep saying you, but that a frog has on its body. And we actually have a really great way of measuring this in a standardized way through I'm going to explain what qPCR is in just a second through qPCR of swabs that we take for frog skin. <clears throat> and this is actually the paper that describes this, this method that we use. And what happens is we can collect a frog in the wild or in the laboratory where we're working with it. We can swab it in a standardized way with a rayon swab. And then we can extract the DNA from that swab. And so we're going to end up getting frog DNA. We'll get BD DNA if it's present. And then we'll get all the microbes that are living on the frog's skin. But what we're interested in is the BD DNA in this particular test. And this was the test I was mentioning earlier that, that uh, they use to tell if BD is in, is in nature. And so what happens is you take the, the DNA and you put it into a reaction in a machine that can target a specific place in the BD DNA. Um, and so it recognizes a certain sequence of BD DNA. And what it does is it takes that sequence and it makes multiple, multiple copies of it. And when I say multiple, I mean thousands to millions of copies of it. And then on top of that, it takes a fluorescent marker and it attaches it to every one of those copies that it makes. And so not only can we tell based on this machine running these reactions for us whether or not we have BD present, but we can also, because the machine can count uh, the fluorescent markers in each reaction, we can get a really good idea um, based on comparing it with some standard DNA of how much BD is on each swab. And so therefore we can say how much is on each animal. Um, so I just wanted to explain that really fast because load and amount of BD DNA becomes really important later on in the talk. Um, but for now I'm gonna switch really fast to the star of the show and that's the mountain yellow-legged frogs. So these guys are actually two species here in the Sierra Nevada, sister species. Um, Rana muscosa, Rana sieri. So these guys are extinct from 95 to 99% of their historic range. And it's not just due to BD. It's definitely, it's played a major role in it. But before we even knew, before BD even came in on the scene, um, uh, uh, mountain yellow-legged frogs were impacted incredibly by introduced trout. And so these are non-native species that were stocked in alpine lakes um, for recreation. And only in the last uh, few decades have they ceased stocking these lakes and, um, and then started to actually reclaim habitat for frogs. But due to this loss, um, 
uh, from both disease and from introduced predators. These guys were both listed on the, um, the National Endangered Species List in 2014. So it's important to know they're entirely aquatic. They spend their entire lives either in or associated with lakes and streams or marshy meadows. Um, the lakes that they live in are frozen nine months out of the year. And so, um, so if there are, when it starts to get cold and when, when it starts to freeze in the Sierra Nevada, all of these animals go to the deepest part of whatever lake that they're associated with, and they spend the winter there. Um, this is really important <coughs> for the fact that they have a long-lived tadpole stage. Their tadpoles don't metamorphose in the same year in which they hatch. It takes them a couple of years. And the reason is because of that very short summer window, these guys aren't able to develop um, fully within the first year, and so they take a few years to, to get fully developed, to eat a bunch of food, and so that they can actually metamorphose into relatively decent-sized adults. Um, <clears throat> it also, this long-lived tadpole stage is important in BD dynamics um, because these guys, the tadpoles actually aren't affected by BD. They become infected in their mouth parts, but it doesn't kill them. So it's really important because this long-lived tadpole stage creates an environmental reservoir of BD in mountain yellow-legged frog populations. There's a long-lived adult stage. Um, after they become sexually mature, these guys are still around for about another 15 years. So every year they're reproducing. And this is also really important in BD dynamics because even if, um, even if there isn't recruitment from their reproduction, if, if their, their um, offspring don't go on to become adults, they're trying every single year. So this is really important too in terms of BD <clears throat> in populations. And then finally, and most important, this species, despite the fact that we have persisting populations, this species is highly susceptible to BD. And so if you take a naive animal from any part, from any part of the range, and you take it into a lab and you put it into controlled conditions and you give it a bunch of BD, it's gonna get infected and if you don't intervene, it's going to die. Um, to give you an idea of the loss um, of, be of mountain yellow-legged frogs across their range. Unfortunately, um, this graphic is not as awesome on the screen as it is on my computer. Um, this is an inset right here of the Sierra Nevada in California. And the, this line here, which this should be a shaded gray area, this shows what is an estimated original um, range for mountain yellow-legged frogs in the Sierra Nevada, and it was derived from a MaxInt model, which takes all of the known um, habitat needs of, um, of animals into consideration, and you can create a model to decide where it was originally. And so then the blue and the pink shaded spots are watersheds within which there is now still at least one existing um, uh, either Ronisieri or Ronamuscosa population, and those are Ronisieri is in the north and is in blue, and Ronamuscosa is in the south and is in red. And then finally, the individual dots are individual populations. And I know it looks like there's a lot of dots up there, but if you look at it, um, there are 94 populations as of 2011 of um, existing Ronisieri, and there's 17 of existing Ronamuscosa. And if you think about the fa fact that there were originally thousands of Ronisieri populations and probably hundreds of Ronamuscosa populations, you realize that the loss has been really, really significant. However, now we need to discuss this idea of persistence versus die-off or persistence versus extirpation. And so what we've witnessed in the Sierra Nevada is that in the north, um, frogs are persisting with BD um, in their populations. And B, these, the, any declines that occurred in these populations occurred before we knew what BD was, and so a lot of them were missed. Um, and, and one day someone's just like, there used to be frogs here and there are no longer frogs here, or there used to be a lot of frogs here and now there are less frogs here. Um, so in these populations, we see high prevalence of BD, um, which is close to 100%. And when I say prevalence, I mean the number of individuals in the population that are infected with BD. So in most of these populations, we see high prevalence, but there are some individuals that actually lose and then <coughs> regain or, uh, infections. And then finally, and this is where load becomes important, or infection intensity, we see really low BD loads in adults and tadpoles, and then we see very high loads, and we see high mortality in subadults. So therefore, um, as I mentioned before, these older adults, they're living, they're healthy, they have BD, but 
they're not, they're, their offspring aren't necessarily making it. And the one thing that's a real saving grace is the fact that those adults live for such a long time and they reproduce every single year. And so sooner or later, we see recruitment in these populations. And this is what keeps these populations going. Now on the south of the Sierra Nevada, we have what we call, what are either naive, meaning that they haven't yet experienced BD, or die off, meaning that they've died because of BD. Um, we have these populations of mountain yellow-legged frogs. And so this is where we're actually seeing the wave of BD still going through. So this is where we're actually still seeing the spread. Um, this has been witnessed in the last 15 to 30 years. Um, in these populations, we see 100% prevalence. So without exception, every single individual in these populations is infected with BD when, it, when there's an outbreak in the population. And in every single individual, except for the tadpoles, which we know that BD doesn't actually kill them, we see very high infection intensity and mortality, so that within the first year or two of the outbreak, all post-metamorphic or adult individuals are gone. And then it just takes the few years that it takes for all of the tadpoles that um, are cycling through their two to four years of tadpoles. As they metamorphose, the infection spreads across their body. They also die, and then the population um, becomes extinct. And just to show you what loads on um, frogs in these different types of populations look like, I'm going to show you a graph. And I'm, uh, I want to explain this to you um, because you're going to see graphs that look like this for the rest of the talk. Um, so what we've got here on the y-axis is zoospore equivalence. So this is what we detect on a swab. And then we take that number and we actually log transform it. And the reason that we log transform it is because first of all, it's easier for data analysis, but also because we're looking at amounts of BD on swabs that range from zero or one, um, like zoospore equivalents, all the way up to over a million. And that can be really hard to represent on a graph. And so when you log transform, every time that you have a tick on the, on the or in this case, I have every second tick, um, it means how many zeros are behind your one. So at zero, that means that is one zoospore. Um, if you could see the one tick, that would mean that that was 10 zoospores. The two is 100 zoospores. Three is 1,000. Four is 10,000. Five, 100,000. And then six is a million. And so um, another thing that happens when you log transform data is that even though there's 10 times difference between every one of your ticks, it compresses it down. So it makes it a little less dramatic. But so it's good to remember that between that every time that we go up one number on our log scale, we're actually going up 10 times in the amount of BD that's on that frog. So with that said, and one last thing, that red line, this is the amount of BD that we know in mountain yellow-legged frogs. If the frog is that infected or higher, and there's no intervention, if that frog is not in some way cleared, then that frog's gonna die. So we call that our threshold um, for, for BD in mountain yellow-legged frogs. So now that I've explained all that, you can see here that I have um, load data in multiple natural populations for populations where we were swabbing during outbreaks where all the animals were dying off, and in populations that are persisting with BD. And you can see that the median, so the dark black line in the middle is the median um, uh, BD load on the frogs is above that lethal line. And you can see that in persistent populations that the, um, that the median is below 100 zoospores. So we're, going, we're looking at a difference between 10,000 or 100 zoospores um, in these animals in extirpated and persistent populations. So other good news in this situation is that mountain yellow-legged frogs are not the only ones that are persisting. And so we see frogs in, um, um, in the tropics of Australia and in um, uh, Costa Rica, so in Central America. Um, we see other frogs that after undergoing significant declines um, actually rebounding um, using different strategies. Some of them are persisting as long-lived adults and having a, a really similar situation to mountain yellow-legged frogs. Some are seeing complete population turnover in one year. So animals don't show any resistance to the disease. They just get infected, reproduce, die, and then the entire population turns over and all of their, um, all of their offspring create the adult population for the following year. <laughs> 
So now, now I get to my why do we care slides. And I know that maybe in this room I don't necessarily need to give these, but, um, but as an ecologist, when you talk about why we need to care, why we need to save animals that are not humans, it's always like, well, why, why, why does that matter? And so um, the very first most obvious thing is that throughout history of people observing mountain yellow-legged frogs and writing it down, they've always said they're really abundant. And so this means that in the past, you could walk through almost any lake or stream in the Sierra Nevada and have to step carefully to avoid stepping on mountain yellow-legged frogs. So this isn't really the case anymore. And, and just the loss of this species is, is just a massive modification of the landscape just in the hole that their, their absence creates. But ecologically speaking, they're also really important members of the food web. Um, mountain yellow-legged frog tadpoles feed off of primary producers, uh, which are algae, phytoplankton, and lakes, and they're responsible for nutrient cycling within lakes. As well, adults eat aquatic insects. Um, they eat other, um, other larvae, other tadpoles, and they also eat their own larvae, as well as the tadpole and adult stages of mountain yellow-legged frogs are a really strong link between the aquatic and the terrestrial food webs and that they are important prey items for native birds and for native garter snakes. So they're important, ecologically speaking. But then also, and this might not be super obvious, um, why do you have a helicopter up there? But also, in the cargo hold of that helicopter are a few bear canisters and some Kevlar bags full of mountain yellow-legged frogs. And the reason I'm showing you guys this is because ever since they started restoring populations after, um, after they began to control non-native trout uh, in the Sierra Nevada, ever since they started trying to, um, to repair the, the damage that was done by non-native trout, there have been reintroduction and translocation measures in place. And of course, now that we have a disease in the mix, it makes things a lot more difficult. But these efforts are, are, have been happening every summer for the last couple of decades. And so it's really important for us as scientists to determine the best way to make these, um, these conservation actions work, the best way that we can make um, frogs able to persist in a landscape that has a disease in it. And then finally, um, there's been a major uptick of fungal diseases in wildlife in the last couple of decades. And we don't know if it's uh, actually a rise, if there are actually more, if we're just noticing now. And I can't actually tell you that, but we do know that, um, the f that fungi actually interact with the vertebrate immune system differently than, say, bacteria or viruses. And we're used to dealing with bacteria and viruses, but dealing with fungi is a different story altogether. And so everything that we can learn from the BD frog system, understanding how BD interacts with its host, we can possibly apply to other fungal disease systems. So this brings me to a place where I'm going to tell you now about some specific questions I've been trying to answer. Um, in the mountain yellow-legged frog BD system. Um, the big question is what factors are driving population persistence or extirpation in mountain yellow-legged frogs when BD invades? <clears throat> and the two questions that I am going to answer or not maybe answer so much for you guys here today um, are a couple of chapters from my dissertation. And the first one is we need to know if mountain yellow-legged frogs actually have an adaptive immune response to BD. And when I say that, I mean, when you talk about an adaptive immune response, that's the response that your immune system creates when it recognizes a pathogen and then tells your body how to continue to recognize it through time. So that any time that your body, that the, the immune system encounters that pathogen, it can be taken care of. Um, this is really important because, and I'll, I'll go into this in just a second, because we're not really sure, or, or haven't been um, in, for, for quite a while, how the immune system interacts with BD, because all we've seen are these really devastating declines. Um, so, and the second question I have, which is not about the frog at all, but which is actually about the environment, is are there environmental factors, which can be either abiotic, which means physical, uh, water chemistry, pH, temperature regimes, are there abiotic environmental factors or are there biotic factors, which can be community composition um, in terms of microbes or uh, zooplankton or benthic invertebrates, that 
when you put all of these factors together, actually influence BD invasion success. So outside of the frog, is there something in the environment that might either encourage or hamper BD's ability to invade a lake? And so I like to represent um, these questions with uh, a, a way of looking at disease that is, is pretty well accepted in, in most disease circles. And that is that there's not going to be one smoking gun answer to this. It's going to be a combination of factors. Um, you might have certain frogs that are more likely to be able to resist infection, um, and they might be in, a, in a, an environment that is, is less hospitable to BD. Um, and then the pathogen itself might be more or less virulent in that particular strain. And I'm not going to talk about the pathogen today, mostly because um, in the Sierra Nevada, we do know that the strains that we have studied so far, uh, so these different isolates that we've isolated from lakes where um, BD has broken out in mountain yellow-legged frogs, that it's actually, they're, they're pretty closely related. They don't vary that much in virulence, and they're all related to the, what we call the global pandemic lineage of BD that is, is spreading throughout the world and is causing the declines that, um, that we're seeing. And so, so I don't work on that, and so I'm going to kind of gloss over that part of it and just really focus on the host and the environment. So to get to the first question, this is, do mountain yellow-legged frogs have an adaptive immune response to BD? And so before we try to answer this question, we have to look to the literature. And I'm going to just super, super gloss over this. But basically, there have been a lot of studies that have been done looking at whether or not amphibians have an adaptive immune response to BD. And some of them are like, absolutely not. There is no response. You know, this, this species, it, it doesn't have a chance. But then there are some studies that are like, yes, we've got an adaptive immune response. This is great. And the one thing that we can get out of this is that it's very species specific. And so if you want to, to know something about a certain species, especially if you're going to use it to inform conservation actions, you really need to look at individual species and quantify and qualify these things within the species. But one thing that we do know is that BD kills frog lymphocytes. And this is something that we know um, from in the lab. It's not something that we've actually seen in pictures in frogs. But lymphocytes are, are immune cells that your immune system uses to recognize pathogens and to defeat them. And it does that either by creating an antibodies or by signaling other parts of the immune system to uh, come and attack. And so when BD is actually able to directly destroy a pretty important part of the immune system, we know that things can't necessarily be good. So we were just like, OK, let's just figure out if this immune response exists, all right? And, um, and the easiest way that we thought to do that was by doing an infection experiment. And so what we did in this experiment is we took a group of naive frogs. So these frogs have never been exposed to BD. They were raised in the lab. And we split them into two separate groups. Group one was our naive control group. And group two was a group that, for now, right now, it's still uninfected, but we're going to call it recent infection. And on day zero of the experiment, on the, the first day that we, that we do anything, we inoculate our group two with BD. And then we inoculate group one with what we call a sham. And the sham is basically all of the kind of residual BD media, like the growth media and stuff that you would find in the inoculation, we expose without BD to our, um, our naive control group so that we know we can pick apart that there isn't any effect of anything that was in the inoculant that's not BD. All right? So one group gets infected, one group doesn't. We let them. We let the, the infected group build up their infections over a few weeks um, because we know that this is the time in which we can still control the infection and they're not going to all die. And then at day 21, we treat them with an antifungal agent that we know is safe and clears them of the fungal disease. <clears throat> and then about a month later, we bring in a third group of animals. And these animals are from the exact same cohort of, um, of naive frogs. Uh, as our first two groups, but they were involved in a previous experiment in which they were infected six months prior. And so now what we've got is we've got a group of animals that are naive, a group of animals that have been reinfected about a month prior, and then a group of animals that were infected about six months prior. And we're going to expose all of them to BD. So even the controls, even the na naive animals, they get BD, and then compare their BD loads. <clears throat> and what we got was actually way more dramatic than we expected. And so 
At this point, this graph should look kind of familiar to you. We have the exact same y-axis where we're looking at the log of zoospore equivalents. We have the same red line that shows us that lethal threshold for mountain yellow-legged frogs. And then I have these in the same order in which I presented them in the experimental design in the previous um, in the previous slide. And so you can see that animals that had no previous exposure to BD ramped up these really high lethal loads um, quite, quite rapidly. Um, animals that had just been exposed 30 days prior had been infected actually didn't get infected. They, and that's not true. Some of them got infected um, for a week. We, so after the first week, we swabbed them. They had these really low level infections. By week two, they were gone. We did have one animal in that group that at the very end of the experiment came up with a really, really low infection that we think might have just been harbored there the whole time and that we couldn't detect. But then most interestingly, in our group that had been infected six months prior, only about 60% of them got infected. So what you're seeing here is, is a, a spread across animals that became infected and animals whose load was zero. And of the animals that actually became infected, they carried these really low sublethal loads um, of BD. And then there were animals that just didn't get infected at all. And to put this into perspective, for comparison's sake, we can now look at what BD looks like in an extirpated uh, uh, population, a population that's undergoing extirpation, I should say, and in a persistent site, and compare that to animals that experimentally, um, I only put on here the animals that actually, um, it's different from the previous one because there are no zeros in here. So the loads of animals that were previously infected against the animals that had no prior exposure to BD. And you can see that they look really similar. And this was really exciting to us because we realized that there is some factor in there of an adaptive immune response that's helping these persistent frogs keep BD at bay um, once they're able to survive. And so our immediate response to this was like, OK, let's apply this. And Roland, who is in the audience, and I'm sure you guys probably know who Roland Knapp is, Roland um, had established a Head Start program for mountain yellow-legged frogs at the San Francisco Zoo, in which animals were taken from um, wild populations. Either they were being rescued from outbreaks in the southern Sierra, or they were actually being collected from persistent populations in the north. And if I can remind you, we still see really high mortality in the, um, in the, the younger metamorphs and subadults in persistent populations. And so, um, so sometimes they'll take animals from these populations and rescue them and then head start them and then use them in reintroductions in other areas in a similar region. And so the idea was like, well, let's test this as a possibility for immunization. Let's see if we can take some of these animals before we release them into um, new sites, we're going to immunize them. And so we did this with some frogs at the San Francisco Zoo. And sometimes the universe just hands you an amazing, amazing experiment that you never thought that you would get to see. And, and I don't know, maybe you guys won't get as excited about this as me. But <laughs> the frogs in one particular year, this has actually been ongoing for a number of years, but there was this one particular year where we had two groups of frogs from the same persistent population, one of these groups of frogs had been collected as eggs. And so when, you're when you collect eggs from nature, they're not infected. You can't pass BD from a parent to egg. And so, um, so these were naive eggs from a persistent population, which is kind of a weird thing because BD's in the environment. And then we had another group that of rescued metamorphs. And so these animals had been brought in from uh, from the field, high, high-level infections, and they had been cleared. And then both of these animals had been um, raised and head-started at the zoo for at least a year. And then so what we did is we broke those two guys up into controls and infection groups. And the reason that we did that was because both of these groups of animals are going to be re-released into um, into lakes in the field, and we wanted to make sure that we could detect whether or not there actually was an effect of immunizing them beforehand. So we, so actually, uh, I'm sorry, actually released control animals that had not been priorly, prior exposed in the zoo to BD. So we have, at day zero, two groups within the naive animals, one's exposed to sham, one's exposed to BD, and then two groups within the exposed, and these guys were previously exposed in nature, one was exposed to a sham, one was exposed to BD. After 21 days, we treated them with the draconazole, and then they were released. I'm not going to talk about release results, because those actually 
take like a decade to actually tell if it's working. So that's, that's not what I'm going to be talking about here tonight. What I'm going to talk about is the fact <clears throat> that in the animals that were collected as eggs from this persistent population, we still saw them get pretty high loads of BD. They're a little lower than maybe the ones that we were seeing in other experiments and that we're seeing in the field. But in this particular experiment, there's a significantly different load carried in a naive animal than an animal that was, first of all, exposed in the wild, so brought in from the wild, as a metamorph. And one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that it's been commonly understood that one of the reasons that we see such high mortality rates in sub-adults, even in persistent populations, is because when, when amphibians undergo metamorphosis, their immune systems have to shut down because their entire bodies are rearranging. And all of this craziness that's going on inside of their bodies while they're rearranging could be rejected by their immune systems. So basically, the, the immune system kind of shuts down while they go through metamorphosis. And so we've always assumed that there's such high mortality in these subadults because they don't really have an immune system to speak of. But so now what we're seeing here is not only we, are we seeing um, this effect in a persistent population of the previous exposure, but we're also seeing it in an animal that we didn't expect to have an adaptive immune response. And this animal sat in a zoo uninfected for a year before we reinfected it. And so, just to lay it all out, the three graphs, um, that, or the two graphs that you've seen previously, in natural populations with different BD um, dynamics in our previous exposure experiment and then now in this experiment. We see that naive frogs carry very high loads um, that will inevitably lead them to death. We see that previous exposure has a lasting effect, uh, a lasting protective effect on frogs. And this lasting protective effect can be started as soon as metamorphosis happens. So um, this was really exciting for us to see. Um, in these um, exposures at the zoo, and these immunizations at the zoo. Okay, I have to move on quickly because I'm running out of time. Um, so now I'm going to move from the host that we now know has an adaptive immune response that we can possibly harness and work with to encourage um, survival and persistence in the field in conservation actions. And now we need to look to the environment and see if there's anything that we can correlate in the environment with persistence versus die-off in mountain yellow-legged frogs. And so I said this before and I'll say it again really fast. The, the factors that I'm looking at include abiotic factors, which are pH, uh, water chemistry, anything that might affect the way that BD is in the environment, is able to live in the environment, as well as any sort of, um, of community interactions. <clears throat> um, we know some things about BD's sensitivity to environmental characteristics. And this is a paper that was published um, pretty soon after um, BD was discovered. And what it did was it looked at BD growing at different temperatures, at different pHs, and, and described how those things affected BD growth. So really fast, before I even start explaining the graphs, I want to show you that the y-axis on all these graphs are exactly the same. And all optical density is, is a proxy for BD growth. Okay, So, so, so what we're looking at on the y-axis is growth of the BD. And this is in culture. Okay. So I'm going to start at the top here. And what we see is that BD is being grown. This is one isolate of BD. And it's being grown at five different temperatures. And I'm going to start with the temperature that's kind of this one lone one in the middle. This is 10 degrees Celsius, which is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see that BD grows slowly but steadily up over 22 days at 10 degrees Celsius. But then when you raise the temperature to between 17 and 25 degrees Celsius, you see a pretty rapid growth and then a leveling off. Um, but this is what's considered kind of the optimal temperature for BD to grow, um, at which it can grow. And then if you see, um, and this range is uh, about 62 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit. And then when you move it up to 28 degrees C, which is that the one on the bottom, you can see that BD does not grow. That's 82 degrees Fahrenheit. And BD can't grow. It's too hot. So the next thing that we learned is they put three different isolates of BD at 4 degrees Celsius, which is 39 degrees Fahrenheit, 
um, for six months to see what would happen to the BD if it would grow at this very low temperature. And you can see that um, in the case of two of the three, it grew steadily and, and I wouldn't say rapidly, but it, it grew pretty steadily over those six months. And one of them just kind of grew and leveled off. But we can tell very clearly that BD is not killed by low temperatures. It slows down growth for sure, but um, it's definitely not killed. And then in terms of pH, you can see here that these are the same three different isolates that they grew at 4C. They grew them in different pH conditions. And you can see that even though there is some variation across the different strains, that they grow ideally at six or seven, a pH of six or seven, can grow limited at eight, um, but BD does not grow in really in acidic conditions um, below six. So we know this about BD. Um, we also know, and I haven't mentioned this yet, but we know that BD is able to live outside of frogs, and we know that because we can culture it. So that's really important to recognize right now, that BD doesn't just have to live in frog skin, because we're able to make it grow on basically gelatin. Um, um, so this showed us also that it's sensitive to culture, nutrients, and chemistry, and that it's sensitive to temperature. <coughs> Excuse me. So. Around the world, in the numerous BD declines that have been documented, there are a few regions that are best documented. Um, that is here in the Sierra Nevada and also in, in other systems in the Western United States. Um, and then also in the tropics of Central America and Eastern Australia and then Spain. And in the tropics and in Spain, we have consistently seen really strong evidence that, so this is tropical, this is the tropical areas. In the lower elevations, um, you have conditions that are very hot and generally too hot for BD. But as you move up in elevation and you move, um, uh, you move up in moisture and you move down in temperature. And so as you move up in elevation in these tropical areas, it becomes more and more optimal for BD growth. And this is the case both in the tropics in Australia and in, um, in Central America, and as well has been shown in, in one species of frog in, um, in Spain. And so when you're in the tropics, you're talking about these, uh, these really large um, uh, assemblages of biodiversity, of different species of amphibians. And if you're a species that lives across that gradient of temperature and elevation, then you might experience declines up at the top because BD is, is able to do its thing and, and to do it voraciously. But at the bottom, you might be spared and you might actually be able to persist with BD because this is, it, it's less optimal for BD growth. Um, and if you're a species that only lives at those, at those higher elevations and the cooler temperatures, then chances are that you're gonna be extirpated. And so the one case of these really well-studied well systems in which that doesn't hold true is in the Sierra Nevada. The Sierra Nevada never experiences temperatures hot enough to kill BD and to control it. But um, one of the things that our research group did was ask the question, so it's really cold here for a really long period of time every single year. Is there some way possibly that these cold temperatures are actually creating some sort of, uh, um, some sort of an advantage for frogs and, um, and, and making them more able to persist? And so Roland and other members of our research group and people at Yosemite um, carried out a multi-year, really intense study that involved looking at persisting populations across elevation and gradient in Yosemite, which is also uh, a gradient of temperature. And, um, and not only did that, not only looked at these, at these populations that were existing in these different elevations, but then also took from one source population, translocated persisting animals to different lakes along an elevational gradient to compare to see if their BD intensities changed as they moved from a different temperature regime from their source population. And it was a, a really beautiful, elegant study that unfortunately resulted in showing no effect whatsoever of, of a temperature gradient that exists in the Sierra Nevada. So we can say, unfortunately, and I'm quoting from the paper, in temperate montane ecosystems, it's unlikely that high elevations will provide amphibians with a refuge from BD. So that's a bummer. So we know that now. We know that, that just temperature isn't going to be what drives dynamics in the environment in the, in, um, the Sierra Nevada. And, uh, but we still know some other things. We know chytrid and BD and chytrids in general are very sensitive to water chemistry. There's a really large non-BD chytrid um, literature 
Uh, we know that chemistry plays a role in fungal outbreaks in aquatic systems, and this is both in, this is in chytrids and in other aquatic fungi. We know that other chytrids other than BD, we know for sure other ones do. We don't, it's possible that BD does. We know that they parasitize, parasitize what I'm calling the micro community. And when I say that, I mean algae, zooplankton, um, uh, microinverts in the, um, in the aquatic community. But we also know that zooplankton, we've seen there's a study that showed that zooplankton eat BD and other chytrids. And in the case of other chytrids, zooplankton eating, B, or eating other chytrids has changed the outcome of a, B, uh, I keep saying BD, but it's a chytrid outbreak in a phytoplankton. And so, so we know that there are actually interactions in the environment um, between different members of the community and chytrids in aquatic systems. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to design a study where I visit a bunch of persisting lakes, so lakes that have persistent frog populations. I'm not expecting you guys to actually know where all of these are, but um, up in the north in Yosemite and in, in El Dorado um, for my persistent populations, and then some die-off populations in um, Kings Canyon and in, in you know, National Forest. And so what I was thinking is that I could collect samples from these lakes, and I could look at uh, water chemistry. I could do elemental analysis. I could look at pH. I could deploy temperature loggers, and then collect zooplankton, benthic inverts, um, whole water, and maybe set up an experiment where I set up what we call little microcosms. So these are, are little tiny treatment tubes that represent the different parts of these lakes. I know this might sound kind of crazy, but what I really wanted to do was separate out the different characteristics of the lake and see if they had any effect whatsoever on how BD survived. And so what I did was from each of four lakes, from each type of lake, um, I created little microcosm tubes, um, made triplicates in each experiment, repeated the experiment twice. And within each lake, I had a whole water treatment, which was meant to represent the microbial community. So this is just all the microbes in whole water, nothing else in the tube. Then I filtered the water with a 0.1 micron filter, which basically takes everything living out of the water, and only what's represented there is the water chemistry. So whatever is in the water, the, the physical characteristics of the water, get to interact with BD. And then I had a treatment where I took whole water, and then I took zooplankton that I collected from the lake, and I concentrated it, and I made this kind of augmented zooplankton treatment. And then finally, I created what was kind of like a mini lake, and that was just whole water and substrate. Um, and then what I did was, and then I had some controls. I had a BD media control, so we could just see how this particular amount of BD, when you stick it into a tube, is going to grow if it's got everything it needs. And as well, um, I did a sterile water tube, um, and this was just regular lab, like super, super clean sterile water as controls. And then what I did was I added BD to all of these microcosms, and, um, and over a period of 10 days measured zoospore mortality, and um, haven't yet, but will be measuring BD colony growth by looking at them through microscopy. So I'm going to kind of ruin it for you here and just let you know that nothing super exciting came out of this, not yet, but I've only done some really cursory um, uh, graphing of the data um, just to see what was going on. And so what this is, is this is qPCR data. So this is the same, um, the same reactions that we use to detect BD on swabs, on frog skin. And I just used it to measure the amount of BD in my microcosms. And so in the little tiny graph up there, you don't really need to see too well what's going on, but those are just my media control on the left and the water control on the right. So you can see what happened in those. And then comparing them to the different treatments in the experiments across all of the lakes within a certain lake type. So we have extirpated lakes or persisting lakes. And here is my water chemistry treatment, so that filtered water. <clears throat> and you can see not much of a difference, nothing major going on. If the BD died, we can still detect its DNA. I can't tell you just from looking at this if the BD is still alive or not. It can just, to tell, you how, just tell you how much BD DNA is in those tubes. But when you bring bacteria and other microbes in, you can see that something starts to happen really fast in these tubes. And um, um, I can't tell you if the microbes in there are actually killing the BD or if they're just breaking down BD after it dies. But there's definitely some effects of, of some interaction effects. Unfortunately, they don't uh, play out across lake type. Um, I did have a certain basin where it seemed like there was very little in one of the persistent lakes. There was very little effect of microbes on BD DNA. Um, and then similar effects in zooplankton interactions. You can see that, that BD was being broken down within these treatments. <clears throat> 
But then what was really interesting to me is that when you bring the substrate in, when you bring in sediment from the lake and you put it in the, into the treatment, it actually seems to have some sort of protective effect over BD in the treatment. And so these are just graphs. This is, there's no statistics run on these. Um, but, but based on these results, I'll be incorporating them in with, um, uh, with some other data to see if there are, um, are any correlations that we can pick out. And one last thing I wanted to show you guys from this, and this is also, um, this is just kind of exploratory graphing. This is not statistics. Statistics. But I ran principal components analysis, analysis, which takes a whole bunch of data, a whole bunch of measurements across all of my lakes and clumps them together according to likeness. So across all of those measurements, the lakes that were most alike are just clumped into a single or each lake and all of those um, all of those variables are, are put into one single dot. And the closer dots are together, the more alike they are. And you can see that there's a couple of lakes in there that are kind of close together. Um, on this one, I have them coded by whether it's a persistent lake or an extirpated lake. But you can see nothing's super clumping together, and it's definitely not clumping by lake type. But you can see that things that are driving the differences in the lakes are silicon content, calcium content, sodium content, and potassium in the lakes. Um, and then I did a cluster analysis, which is another type of principal components analysis, but it just tells you, okay, how do these lakes clump out together? And um, unfortunately, it used the same colors, and I should have fixed that. This is not persistent versus die off. Unfortunately, in the, cl in the cluster analysis, in um, group one, there is one persistent lake and three extirpated lakes, and in uh, group two, in cluster two, there's actually one extirpated lake and one persistent lake. So we are seeing some, some differences amongst these lakes in terms of water chemistry, not really playing out in terms of, um, of what we saw the outcome of BD in the mountain yellow-legged frogs there. And so for this experiment, I still have actually all the microscopy to do. What I need to determine is in, when I looked at that PCR data, if we were looking at BD DNA that was from zoospores, if we were actually looking at DNA that was from uh, BD that had grown from the zoospores into colonies, it's going to be really interesting to see if there are some actual interactions that we can pick out through microscopy, as well data analyses that take into consideration all of the community members of these lakes um, and, um, and chemical features. And then also in the works, um, in Yosemite, there, we possibly will be undertaking a kind of large-scale survey of lake chemistry and temperature and habitat type um, just to compare across the park um, kind of unknown lakes of interest that are possible um, lakes that will be, uh, populations will be reintroduced into as compared to um, lakes where frogs are persisting and where we know they've died off. So with that, I'm going to stop talking about things that I'm doing, and I'm going to close with some good news. Um, and this is work that was recently published uh, by Roland and folks at Yosemite and some others in our research group. And what this is, is this is a study that looks at frog abundance data, mountain yellow-legged frogs, in Yosemite National Park only. Um, but it's abundance data from the last 20 years. And basically, by, by really getting down into this data, they realized that there's been an 11% increase over the last 20 years, average increase over the last 20 years, of all existing frog populations in Yosemite. And so this quote that I have up here basically sums up that not only when frogs are able to persist somehow with the disease that they're encountering, but also when you restore habitat and take away stressors like introduced trout, it's actually possible, at least on a, like a regional level, um, that you can undo and that you can reverse declines that we see in amphibians. And this is kind of the, the shining bright hope, is that um, through really successful management and really informed management, that we're able to, um, to undo these. And just to show you really fast some of the data from this, on the top we have a graph that just shows change in abundance in all of these frog populations across the 20 years. And the black line is the actual numbers, and the big gray area is actually um, it's a 95% a, a confidence interval, saying what the, the actual number across all the, the populations um, the change actually is. And the reason that there's such a wide confidence, confidence interval is that this is looking at populations that have just a few reproducing um, individuals in them, but then also some that have hundreds. And so when you break out the data from the biggest populations, 
um, of frogs in uh, Yosemite National Park, you can see that from the mid-90s into the 2000s, that populations have definitely increased substantially. And this is something to be really hopeful about. So with that, I'm going to close. Um, I have some acknowledgments. Uh, I'm actually going to go through them really fast. Um, my, I should say that everyone in the top part of this should be co-authors on this talk. So Sherry, Bree, Vance, Roland, Tom. Um, I, I only have my name as an author in this talk, but all of the work that I just presented to you was in collaboration with all of these people. And, um, and nothing, none of this work would have been done without Roland. Um, I have lab mates that have been so incredibly helpful to me over the years, Tom Smith, Mark Wilbur, Andrea Yanni, Andrea Adams. Um, so I have to thank them. Jesse Bouchelle, who's the conservation director at the San Francisco Zoo, is an amazing collaborator and we've become good friends um, over the period of time. Nathan Marincelli was my, under, or my undergrad field assistant last summer. And then I have to give a really big shout out to Valentine Eastern Sierra Reserve, um, the Snarl and Valentine, specifically to Carol, um, has been in the short time that we've known each other, has been so supportive, so helpful. And, um, but also to Dan, the director emeritus. Um, Dan was also so supportive, so helpful, really um, encouraging of our research. And also Kim Rose, who is the administrative assistant and lab tech here, who I'm pretty sure that nothing would happen if it wasn't for Kim around here. Um, and then also to, there's a lot of managers um, that have been really encouraging and helpful. And I wanna point out specifically that Carrie Schlick from Inyo National Forest, um, took such an interest in the project that I was doing last summer that she, on the second time that we went into the big, pan, big, pine, big pine lakes basin, sorry, she packed all of our gear in on her own personal horses and made it so that we didn't have to carry all of our gear the nine miles into, uh, into the sites and gave us really awesome US, Fish and, uh, I'm sorry, US Forest Service swag. Um, I'm wearing a US Forest Service hat there. And so I really want to thank her. And then need to thank all of the people who supported, or all of the funding agencies, including Val uh, Valentine Eastern Sierra Reserve Research Grant and uh, Matthias um, Grant, both from the Natural Reserve System, in addition to some other funding that I've had. And with that, I'm going to shut up and thank you guys and take any questions. Thank you so much. Yes. Is there a mechanism by which humans uh, transfer the BD from one lake to another? It's a really good question, and we were just talking about this today at lunch. So when we talk about the movement of BD through space, we have to think about it on different scales. And so globally, we can definitely blame humans. I mean, in terms of our movement of amphibians around the world and our movement of water and products that could carry BD. Um, on the regional scale, it's a really different story. Both in the Sierra Nevada and in Central America, where BD declines were witnessed and heavily, heavily studied, the way that BD moved across the landscape was literally in a wave. And it was not, it didn't go along trails, um, it went over ridges. And the only way that we can explain that is through uh, movement from animals. Um, so from birds, insects, possibly other frogs. Um, <clears throat> There are lakes in the Sierra Nevada where BD wasn't present in the amphibians there and, um, and maybe have just recently in the last couple of years become infected that are literally a foot off of the JMT. And so if you think about the, the literal human highway of people walking past this lake and for 20 years when we knew that BD was in surrounding basins and it was in that area, I don't want to say 20 years, it's probably too much, um, probably a decade in which BD was in that area and it hadn't actually made it to that lake yet. We, we were really hesitant to actually blame people on that kind of smaller scale. Yeah. Yes. That's also a really great, great question. So, um, okay, so the, the medicine that we use to clear frogs of their infection, to clear mountain yellow-legged frogs of their infection, is actually a cherry-flavored human preparation of an antifungal that's used for human fungal diseases. And um, it is, it's actually highly toxic to frogs. And so what we have to do to clear them, or even to kind of beat down their infections, is we have to soak them in 
baths of it for seven to 11 days in a row before we actually get rid of the infection. And so it's really practical and it works really well in a lab setting, but in the field, um, if you think about, especially in the Sierra Nevada, we're talking about field sites that are anywhere between five and 25 miles into the back country. And so if you're trying to intervene in a, um, uh, in uh, an outbreak, it's possible to go out there and it's possible to treat frogs. But we don't have a chemical that we can just put into lakes. Because if you think about the idea of putting an antifungal chemical into a lake, and if you think about how important fungi are to the ecosystem, you know, fungi break down everything. Um, and so we, there's no way that we could do that without having really serious ecological impacts. So, um, so treating frogs and intervening in outbreaks is actually a really, really difficult business, which you can ask Roland about, because um, he's the one who's actually done it in the field. Yeah. Yes. You showed evidence of uh, the frogs getting acquired immunity to the chitrid fungus. Mm -hmm. The, the long-term hope would obviously be genetic immunity, uh, uh, you know, with populations over time developing more resistance. Has there been evidence of that, or are people looking at acquired Genetic as well? Yes, actually I am, and I couldn't even go there in this talk. Is it was the, it's the one chapter of mine that I don't have any data from yet, and so instead of even mentioning it, I decided to hold off and assume maybe someone would ask questions. Um, there's no so in any of the th of the characteristics that we're looking at that might influence persistence, there is no smoking gun. There's no one thing, like I said before, that, that we know could make this change. But there have been in other frog systems, um, there's certain immune genes, there's a, a really large gene family, and it's actually in all vertebrates. That, so all vertebrates have an adaptive immune system, and it's actually really similar, um, whether you're a frog or you're a human. And there's a set of genes called the major histocompatibility complex that is responsible for, um, for recognition of pathogens. And what happens is when you have a pathogen invade, it usually gets ch like chopped up into pieces by your cells or by parts of your immune system. And, and then those pieces of the pathogen are presented to cells. And these MHC molecules, the major histocompatibility compatibility complex molecules, recognize them and then tell them, like tell your immune system, hey, look at this. This is bad. We need to recognize this. And and then you need to kill it anytime you see it. So um, there, are, there are multiple copies of these genes in, in vertebrate genomes, and there's definitely evidence that certain genotypes, so certain, there's different alleles, you get different alleles for each gene copy, whether you get it from your mom or your dad, um, and that there are certain alleles that offer some sort of protection to BD. Um, so my third chapter of my dissertation is actually looking at MHC genotypes in mountain yellow-legged frogs. Um, we have a, actually a really beautiful system in that one of these um, basins that, was, uh, that had major declines and that we thought was going to be extinct um, it's starting in 2004, we've actually found one population there that it, it is, it has all the hallmarks of persistence. And so we have tissue samples from that basin when the decline occurred uh, 10, 13 years ago, and we now have current tissue samples from the animals that are living there. And so what we can do is we can not only look and see what, um, uh, what MHC genotypes exist in those animals, but if there has been any change since before and after the outbreak. So the long and short answer is yes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yes. So in terms of that exact mechanism, um, frogs are, are definitely eaten very quickly when they die um, by aquatic invertebrates. Um, uh, by tadpoles, we've seen definitely seen tadpoles feeding on on dead frogs. Um, but in terms of them spreading it through eating frogs, we don't we can't necessarily say that that's happening. But we do know that BD can um, either attach to or possibly grow on other invertebrates, um, so on insects, on crayfish. Um, they can live actually live within the is that is that right? They live within the crop of crayfish. Um, and so could move from one system to another that way. Um, so there is evidence that, that it would transfer that way, but we don't know if it's just because they're in the environment and they're getting BD or if they're getting it from directly consuming frogs. Yes. 
In other words, if you have a sterile lake and there's no, there's no uh, frogs, mm -hmm. it sounds as if, they, it's kind of hard to read all that and digest it quickly, it sounded like you felt there was a reservoir that doesn't involve the, the frogs, uh, adults, subadults, or Right, so like I mentioned, we know that BD does not have to live on, uh, on frogs or on invertebrates. We know that it can live off of a host because we can culture it. And, and the fact that we, can, that we can culture it means that it can possibly do this in the environment. And so even though no one, it wouldn't be a very simple thing to do, but no one has actually taken an environmental sample, said, oh, there's a chytrid, I can see it under the microscope, taken that exact chytrid and then uh, run d uh, PCR on it and saying, oh, okay, this is BD. Like, you can see a chytrid-like organism in a sample, and then you can take that sample and you can extract it and, and, and you can say, okay, yeah, there's definitely some BD in here. But unless you can actually observe it growing as a, you can see a sporangia growing in the environment free of, of BD, or free of fogs, I'm sorry, then it's really hard to say unequivocally, yes, it's growing in the environment. But that aside, we all believe that it is. We all totally believe that, because most chytrid fungi that are not um, that are not living on on uh, amphibians are saprobes, meaning that they do break down things in the aquatic environment, and that they do live off of um, off of uh, decaying matter. So there's no reason for us to believe that it's not just living out in the environment. So. You're just extrapolating from BD specifically to the general population, or extrapolating from general chytrids to BD, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the opposite way. Yeah, assuming that if it can happen in those other kitchens, then it can happen in BD. Yeah, yeah. Are there any other questions? Yeah? I was just wondering, we had one of the prior lectures, and uh, they were going to the point of figuring out and actually trying to remove the trout from sensitive habitats. Yes. And they were discovering that was not easy to do. I was wondering about any updates on that. Oh, I mean, it's not easy to do, but uh, trout removal is is widespread throughout um, the Sierra. And the thing is, is they're they're not getting rid of trout altogether. They're removing it from um, certain po uh, certain habitats that have been recognized as critical habitat for frogs, as as um, restoring connectivity between frog populations. Um, so there's definitely a really strong criteria for the way that they choose to do trout removal. Um, it's not easy, but it's it's definitely being done. And and trying to do it sensitively with the you know with the kind of the sportsman community in in mind, um, but also trying to make it possible to restore these populations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I'm sure Mary would be happy to entertain any more questions. Sure. Over a beer, I would love it. <laughs> Please join me in thanking uh, Mary tonight. Thanks.